Our first talk is going to be by our uh, president and chief scientific officer, Christoph Koch. Thank you, Julie and Tom. All right, I want to talk about, uh, provide a, a few comments about, the, to set the, the, the table, as it were, for the Allen Institute. And then I was also asked to give a few comments on, uh, on, on uh, leadership. Let me see, how do I? All right, so we um, studied two species, the brains of two species, and right now only two species, which is the, um, the mouse and the human brain. They pretty much uh, differ by a factor of 10 to the 3, a factor of 1,000 in terms of number of neurons in cortex, total number of neurons in terms of volume and in terms of surface area, all pretty much scales by a factor of between 2,000 and, um, and, um, and 4,000. But of course, the basic constituency is remarkably similar. So if I give you a little piece of uh, a tiny grain-sized piece of cortical tissue, which is as I like to say, the most complex piece of organized matter in the known universe, it's difficult to tell it apart except if you use uh, f techniques like we use with, uh, with uh, microscopes and with, um, with gene expression atlas. The basic stuff is, is, um, is remarkably similar. Now, we focus furthermore not only on two species but also on one particular part of the brain, the neocortex, which in us, as, as you all know, it's a pizza, 14-inch pizza. You have two of them. They're two to four millimeters thick, and they're all, um, you know, they're uh, wrapped up and put inside your two, uh, inside the, in the skull. So it's really a tissue. It's a two plus epsilon dimensional tissue. And across, uh, if you look across um, the mammalian phylum, it scales roughly by, a, in terms of area, by 60,000 to 80,000 um, from, from a very small animal that's, uh, uh, that's less than a cubic um, uh, millimeter to, uh, to the brain of a, of a dolphin that has twice as many cortical neurons as, um, as we have. But, uh, but, the, but basically, it's always a tissue. Um, uh, it's relatively uniform. So in other words, it's translational invariant across the cortical surface. And, and although there are lots and lots and lots of differences, of course, between any, uh, any two particular cortical areas, and the question we'd like to ask, what is the sort of the colonical, columnar operation that's being performed by, by these various pieces of tissue? Because obviously mam mammals are very, very successful. They exist everywhere and uh, in, all in almost all ecological niches. And so therefore, um, and we have high natural intelligence, and uh, we all believe that that's, uh, all the evidence from patients, et cetera, seem to suggest that primarily derives from cortical tissue. So the question is, what is the, what is the canonical operation that's provided by tissue that enables sort of um, intelligence, uh, mentation, cognition, um, memory, and of course also consciousness, which is particularly the content of consciousness, which is closely associated with, uh, with cortex. We study, we study uh, cortex, particularly neocortex, using sort of um, different ways to decompose it. Sort of, I like the, the approach pioneered by uh, Herb Simon and, and, and David Ma, a multi-level approach um, in terms of three levels of understanding. You want to understand the stuff at the, level of, um, at the level of the hardware, just like you can understand an, a phone. So a, a typical modern phone will have, for example, 20 sensory components. We'll have 20 different independent um, ways to acquire sensory information. So you can, understand, you can sort of try to understand the individual components and then the transistors and the memories and all of that. So here we, 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 we like to understand the components at the level of synapses, at the level of cell types, and the level of canonical circuits. Then we like to understand what are the computations being performed by these various uh, components, just like you can understand um, if you know about ANG or NORT or, or NOR logic, you can try to understand the basic circuit performed by the GPUs and the ALUs and the other circuit components. And then finally, just like an iPhone, you can try to understand, you can just understand it by, by looking at the various applets and how to program the applets and what the applets do. In terms of um, the brain, of course, it, its most important function is that it behaves, it, it cognitates, and it behaves, and so we can understand it, and we also have to understand it at the level of, the cogni uh, at the level of cognition. Because we are here focused exclusively at the cellular level approach. We don't do functional sort of fMRI imaging. We don't do any bulk tissue uh, technique. That means sort of in terms of human research, it's, it's, uh, we, we don't have access, of course, to the cellular level um, uh, of, um, um, of computation in, in humans. So, so for, the, um, for the human research that we'll do that you'll see today and tomorrow, we're sort of limited uh, studying components and computations. 
uh, so these are some of the, uh, the uh, and the question that sort of collectively we, by we I mean sort of our team of 330 people right now that are all now sited in this beautiful building, uh, seek to address at the component level, as I said, what are the uh, uh, different types of synapses, particularly with respect to their, to their cell type specificity and to their plasticity. Uh, how do we define different cell types in cortex and how do they differ uh, across different cortical areas? What are the different cortical circuits? And then the, the, uh, what are the computations being performed? Here we are again biased, um, um, unabashedly so, and we focus right now on the visual system of the mouse. In human, we typically, we, 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 we're looking at more frontal structures, temporal, temporal medial lobe, and uh, prefrontal structures. But in, in the mouse, we're looking at vision, trying to understand how visual information is processed, fully well realizing, of course, there are 23 other structures that the retina projects to besides the, the LGN and from there to, to, primary vi um, to primary visual cortex. So we try to understand things like attention and a particular object recognition and learning of object recognition. And then we, we, um, we use sort of a variety of different techniques starting from array tomography and electromicroscopy through um, all the techniques that molecular biology has made available to, um, to recording from the tissue using both uh, electrodes as, uh, as well as uh, photons using two photon calcium imaging, uh, doing large scale anatomical reconstruction, doing single cell characterization, then also doing uh, modeling at, at a variety of level of granularity, including uh, point models, including very detailed biophysical models, including also very abstract models and, and theoretical consideration using, for example, Bayesian, um, Bayesian idea, um, probabilistic reasoning and to what extent that's implemented in the brain of, um, of mammals. So I wanted to show you what a little brain is capable of, and then I wanted to show you what a big brain is capable of uh, at the end. So this is, this, is the, this, is, this is not a lab mouse. It's not C57, but it's a, it's a wild-type mouse, and it's pretty amazing what a single mouse uh, can be capable of. Oh, don't tell me I can't. Yeah. So this is a very, very complicated uh, parkour, right? It's not just a single, it's not just a single yes/no operation. Um, and this animal has been trained uh, by by her trainer. She's German. Within a couple of hours of training, just using positive reinforcement, and it's really amazing what this animal can do and remember to do in 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 its proper sequence. And if you look at it, if you look at the movie and you look at the animal you also, of course, cannot help but, but feel a, a, a kinship to the animal. And uh, an important point I wanted to make here that by all measures that we know of, uh, this animal uh, most likely also has, uh, has conscious experiences. It's a conscious being, just like us. Just like us, it's, it's here. It experiences life. We're all nature's children. And just like us, it's bookended between two eternities. And we ought to remember that when we um, when we treat, um, when we do experiments with these, uh, with these animals, that we have to do it with, uh, with compassion. Sean, are we going to get this type of behavior soon? <laughs> so that's pretty impressive. So that's what a mouse can do. So we study um, these sorts of um, creatures. And so when we go to the brain, of course, first we need to understand exactly where we are. And over the last uh, 12 years, ever since we started, 
with the, in the old Atlas days, we've made a, we've built a succession of ever more accurate atlases. This is the latest um, version of it, sort of the, the, the third iteration that we released um, this year, the, the uh, common coordinate framework. So here you can see on the left a superposition of um, 1,675 different brains. So you can see we can, they're really well aligned. That's, of course, the advantage of working with, uh, in, uh, with inbred mice isn't that much variability. So we have a very high resolution, three-dimensional volumetric um, atlas that has a, um, a few hundred million um, um, voxels. Um, so we know every time we do a recording, every time we, do, we put an electrode in and we do two photon calcium imaging, or we do a slice experiments, or we do um, um, a connectivity experiments, we know exactly where we are. And of course, all of that, all of that data is, is, is made available. Um, then we, we want to know what connects to what. So over the, uh, over the last years, we've built a series of, um, um, of, uh, of these mesoscopic connectivity atlases. Here you see uh, one version that was published um, and two years ago, where on the, um, and going across each one is, um, is, um, is an injection in one mouse in one particular part, let's see here in the midbrain, on the stratum, in the isocortex. And then here you can see it's, uh, it's, um, um, it's, um, it's projectional signature in terms of the um, a log of, a, of an intensity signal, of the fluorescent signal um, obtained by injecting an AVV virus and then um, recovering the brain, slicing it, doing two photon calcium imaging every 100 micrometers. So you reconstruct the entire brain in 140 sections with 0.35 micrometer XY pixel resolution. And then you count this. Um, um, and you measure the, the intensity, and you, uh, you, um, you binarize it, and then you, you, um, you count it for any one uh, um, projection signal, and then here you express it in terms of log signals. So you can, see, you can see there's a huge variability in terms of the amplitude. It varies roughly over a factor of 60,000. It's uh, to very good approximation log normal distributed. Um, and here you can see all the projectional signature in the, in the ipsilateral on the same side where the injection was, and here you can see on the contralateral side. And now you can do mine it. So this is just wild type, and we now, in the meantime, have um, roughly 2,000. Uh, we have this sort of data from, from both wild type animals and from Cree animals um, available in our atlases, and anybody can download it. We haven't written up, we, 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 we only now in the, in the process of writing up all the data and for publication. This original version was published a couple of years ago in, in Nature. So it enables you to have a, ho a whole view of the, entire, of the entire brain and its connectivity. And since we keep on using the same method, as we get better, as we get more specific transgenic animals with, which have specific population identified, we can place all that information in the context of all the previous information. So it's an incredible, rich, ever-growing resource. And we're now beginning to reach out to the community to incorporate um, under careful conditions and to incorporate others, um, other people's um, mice data also in here. Um, then we, 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 we need very good models of individual neurons for a variety of reasons. We want these models, both we want to understand how many different types of neurons there are, because we're pursuing the hypothesis that every sort of single neuron can be can be put into one bucket, just like every element we know can be put, can be arranged, um, every natural element can be arranged in a, in a particular place on the periodic table. We are pursuing the hypothesis that every neuron can be assigned to a particular type of cell type. And so we, we, we need to define these cell types, and we want to use different modalities, both transcriptional modalities as well as uh, morphology, as well as electrophysiology, as of course has been done over the last 120 years. And so we're doing this for both um, a, a mouse uh, tissue as well as for human tissue from neurosurgical um, material. So uh, again, we need to place where exactly do we record every time we record a cell, because there might be, or surely there will be gradients of particular properties as you go, rostral caudal, or anterior posterior, et cetera, in the brain. We, we, we're doing electrophysiology on a standard, on a standard protocol. We, we use the standard protocol that we do in every single cell, like 40 minutes, 50 minutes protocol with steps, rams, white noise, frozen noise, pink noise. Um, uh, pulses, etc. Then we do both sort of these automatic fitting of, of so-called generalized li linear integrated fire or generalized linear models, where we just treat the, the, the neuron as a point model and reduce the entire complexity uh, to a single point, uh, um, uh, and then measure the output both in terms of the voltage at the soma as well as the spikes. 
um, we can uh, we 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 are reconstruct we are injecting biocytin then reconstructing the morphology of the neurons both you, um, dendrites and and axons of course it's always in the slice. Um, then well, I'll show you one slide more. We're doing uh, uh, RNA sequencing analysis in order to get at the the, the genes that are expressed and use. Um, a uh, supervised and unsupervised learning algorithm to try to discover how many different cell types there are uh, purely by, by transcriptional methods and then correlating that with the cell types we find using morphology or, and or electrophysiology because uh, ultimately that's what we get. We'd like to obtain an um, ontology of the different cell types. As well, we also like to obtain the detailed models because those models we then, we then going to use um, to populate our large-scale computer models of, of cortex. Right, so we use so we use this um, all this data not only to do um, this uh, and the clustering, but also to obtain data uh, to obtain data that feed our models. Uh, and you, as you know, this is um, the the first version of this. The couple of hundred cells uh, has uh, has gone online, so you can just anybody now on the planet's face can download all the data. Can you can click on here? This shows you the back of the of the of the brain of a mouse of cortex. This is, this is primary visual cortex. You can click on any of these points. Then you can get, for example, um, you know, if you click on this point, you get this recording. You can click on this panel and to zoom in to get all the different individual traces of all the actual data. So this is not just like in a standard publication where you get a one flat panel and that's it. You have to believe the data. Here, all the data you can inspect. You can go to the raw traces, to the individual raw traces that we digitize and and dance and and sample at 43 um, kilohertz to inspect the you know to inspect the individual traces to make sure that you know that they. That, that they do what we say they do. You can get at the morphology. We reconstruct using sort of automa or semi-automatic tools, our annotation team, uh, together with our um, computational anatomy with VAS3D, sort of reconstruct the morphology of these. So you can download all of these uh, in standard SVW, um, uh, SWC uh, format. Um, all of that uh, data is, um, uh, is available. And then we have a, we have a large um, transcriptional effort. There's now a paper coming out in Nature, in nature Neuroscience. Um, and we, we are moving this now in sort of under standard condition and, and a, in a standard uh, pipeline where we want to do this same technique in many, many different types of tissue, both human and, and, and mouse tissue, where we, go, uh, where we use RNA um, seq, cell seq, and now switching to smarter, to smarter uh, version 4 where we uh, characterize using fact sorting, in this case, uh, 1,700 cells in primary visual cortex from both wild type as well as uh, uh, cream mice, where we can identify, uh, using these uh, clustering techniques, 49 different uh, types of cells. And very satisfactory for those of us who grew up reading the Hitchhiker Guides to the Universe, we find exactly how many neurons? 42. We find exactly 42. 23 inhibitory cell types in, v, in primary visual cortex and 19 excitatory cell types and seven non-neuronal cell types. Now we're going back and doing this analysis even deeper, doing deeper sequencing, et cetera, to make sure, because it's well possible that, there are, that if we look, if we look um, deeper and do more cell analysis, we'll find more rare cell types. And so it's well possible that the final number will, in fact, it's quite likely that the final number will not remain at 42, unfortunately. Um, then we, we are, uh, as I said, we're very interested in understanding the brain not just at the level of slice and being able to reconstruct and understand the dynamics in terms of computer simulation in a slice, but we want to understand the real thing, the real brain in the context of, uh, of behavior. So we are, we are setting up these behavioral suites. Uh, sort of where we can train many, many mice under highly standardized conditions. So obviously this precludes these sort of protocol that I just showed you, the opening movies. So here the mice, we use this, uh, this disk technology. The, 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 the mouse runs on this disk here, slightly inclined, and then it, it sees um, on, the right, on the right hemifield, it sees various visual patterns. Here, for example, it sees standard sort of Gabor patches, and they can be different orientation, for instance, and the animal can be perfectly well trained to, just, to stop and get a reinforcement of water for one particular orientation and to run past other orientations. It can perfectly well do that. And you can show using optogenetic experiments that primary visual cortex is causally involved. So we know this is not just correlates, but this structure is actually involved um, in, in, in this particular standard visual discrimination. Right? This is a visual discrimination as you would do just a standard two alternative first choice in any psychophysics lab. Here we're doing it in, a, in, a, in, in our animals. 
Uh, I think there's a movie here showing. Yeah, so there you can see it. And of course, in, um, we're now building in, um, in um, our structured science a group is building what we call the brain observatory. So where we have, where we will have within half a year five different, uh, five um, two foot and calcium imaging microscopes in parallel, five, uh, five setups where these mice are trained to run to do these various uh, things. Um, and, and then we have this two foot and calcium imaging. We have a team of, of, of neurosurgeons that operates carefully, that puts these, these transparent windows um, into the skull, although we can also do through skull imaging. We, we're doing intrinsic imaging. The, the movie didn't work. We're do also doing intrinsic imaging in each, each mouse, just using very similar techniques to the ones you would use in, in human fMRI to identify a host of visual areas so we know exactly where we are with respect to the um, to these landmarks of, of V1 and AM to uh, V1 and all the higher visual um, cortical, so we do that routinely, so we can exactly pinpoint. Um, um, yeah, we, we're doing that using intrinsic. Well, here you can see it using intrinsic imaging. Here you can see V1 and, and other visual areas, and then we're doing two foot and calcium imaging systematically in different areas in V1 in a slew of areas around primary visual cortex in using different Cree lines in different layers so that we can get a sort of a holistic view not just of one particular population but of, of many different populations. And again, all that data will be made available. We have to massage it, we have to analyze it, we have to do ROI analysis, detraining is a lot of computations. For those of you who've ever done this, you know this, we have to do um, and then in order to put the data outside using a standard um, uh, standard protocol, NWB, this newly developed, that we were involved in developing this new standard uh, for data and metadata called Neurodata Without Borders um, to, to allow all of us to communicate very easily across different labs, across different uh, recording techniques like electrophysiology and optical physiology. And we're also involved in these, in these efforts to sort of more quickly, this is Big Neuron, to more quickly auto, to automate uh, Right now, it's sort of semi-automated, but ultimately to move complete automation of doing large-scale reconstruction of thousands and millions of neurons automatically, both axons as well as uh, both dendrites as well as their much thinner axons using this tool called VAS3D, together with the with the worldwide community. Then in the in the human, so this is all mouse. In the human, of course, we've done our as as you all know, we have these large-scale um, human atlas, transcriptional atlas, where we did roughly in a thousand locations, microarrays in six neurotypical uh, brains, where we can look at the gene expression. Uh, and uh, we just have this beautiful vignette online. I really would urge you to, to look at it. You can just um, look at the website. What you see there is essentially the comparison. If you, this is um, over six brains, the consensus. If you look at any two locations in those, in those brains and you ask how many genes are differentially expressed between any two locations in the, in the, uh, um, um, uh, in the brain, um, this is the, the answer is given by, by, um, and by this dynamic diagram that you can click on to find out more information. So um, up here, you, um, and you can see the, uh, the scale up here. So blue means uh, no differences above threshold. Threshold here, I think, is a log two factor. So what's remarkable is that the two pieces of truly t of laminar tissue in the brain, which is cortex and cerebellum, right? So 69 billion of your 86 billion, Four out of every five neurons in your brain are in the cerebellum, and genetic and transcriptional speaking, they're all very, very similar. Okay, at the gyral level, right? They're all very similar. Same thing with the single exception of primary visual cortex. Cortex as a tissue, if you look at different gene expression, is relatively similar. Now, of course, if you go in detail in cortex and you do PCA analysis, you can perfectly well see their differences. Half of those differences are explained by distance. So in other words, within cortex. There are many fewer differences in terms of gene expression than between cortex and any other part, or let's say, you know, the various basal ganglia or the, the, um, the hypothalamus. But then they are, the, the difference that they are essentially to first order are proportional to the distance along the cortical sheath, right? So, you know, your cortex is like this, and the farther you are apart, the more, the more, um, the more different the, the transcriptional expression. I mean, it really gets, drives home the point that the, it's a physical stuff, right? It's physical matter there in, in, in brain that actually does a computation. 
And many genes, so this just came out in Nature Neuroscience last week, many genes are very highly consistently expressed. So here, for example, you can see, uh, you can see for one particular uh, uh, gene the expression in these six different brains. It's really highly, highly consistent. And those, the genes that are highly consistent, you can decompose all of them into 32 patterns. So rather than keeping track of 20,000 individual gene expression in the entire human brain, you can explain most of the variants by just looking at 32 patterns. Then the, uh, the other thing we're doing since a um, year and a half now, we work with uh, five neurosurgeons here local at the UW and at Swedish, and we work with them to get access to their uh, cortical human excised tissue. So as you, as you may know, in any routine um, neocortical, uh, neurosurgical practice, typically, I'm looking for something here, but I don't have a sugar cube uh, on me, unfortunately. Very often, so let's see, you have, um, uh, let's say you have an um, epileptic uh, foci uh, and it originates here deep in the hippocampus and the surgeon has to take it out because the medication doesn't work anymore. In order to access that, the surgeon has to, has to dig a tunnel or cut a tunnel through this overlying piece of, of healthy uh, cortex. So typically that piece of tissue, a little bit is, is given to the pathologist. Most of it is discarded as medical waste, which is really sad. It's really, you know, Sad. So we now work with them. There's a huge amount of paperwork and HIPAA and all of that involved. But at the end of it, we get now routinely once every week or once every two weeks, we get a piece of tissue that maybe, you know, that maybe sometimes it's tiny. Typically, it's like a sugar cube. Sometimes, you know, it can be like a finger. Or sometimes it can even be larger when a, when, a, when a larger part of the temporal lobe is removed. So they remove it either for epileptic seizure or, or for, 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 for tumor. And of course, we do histology on the tissue. But then we can analyze it. We can put it in... in our, 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 our lab, we can, do, um, we can do slices, we can do recording on it, so it turns out to be much easier to record from than mouse tissue. Uh, we can routinely record now for two days or even three days, we can record um, synaptic connections. We have a quad patch uh, set up and we can record um, synaptic connections among them. You know, you, sorry, you can get, um, you can get uh, interneurons here. Uh, over there, they are. You can inject them with biocytin and do and do reconstruction. So essentially, we can do the same sort of workflow uh, once it's in there as we can do in um, in, in in mouse. We're also using viral tissues, uh, um, virus vectors uh, to infect the tissue to try to get specific uh, cells um, uh, labeled because, of course, there are no uh, there are no Cree lines. Then lastly, we are also trying to understand the lineage of these uh, neurons. How do they arrive in, in early de uh, development? We, we are particularly focused here to, um, on, on what's called a transcription factor code, i.e. What, what is the specific code which uh, uh, we hypothesize, this is in co uh, work done in collaboration with Sharad Ramanasad and Harvard, which we hypothesize is a very simple code that gives rise to the entire diversity of cells. So if there are 49 cells in V1, how, how, how do they arise throughout development? And so here you can see this is, a, in fact, um, the, the talk just after me will talk about the excited lineage. This is a picture from the inhibitory human lineage um, derive, uh, deriving the, uh, from a progenitor early on all the way to day, um, to day 125. Um, yeah, we are, as you'll see, we're also involved. There'll be a number of posters uh, on this on a on a, in a variety of community setting standard. I mentioned already once, the new data without border. This is together with lots of other people, including the Kavli Foundation, HHMI, et cetera, together with our good friends in, 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 in England at the Gatsby and the, at the Wellcome Foundation and HHMI. We're involved in building uh, some very advanced uh, probes that have up to 960 tiny electrodes, silicon probes, where you can record, that you can record from. You can choose 360 or so of them in a tiny, tiny piece of wire much thinner than a human hair. We are doing this with a Belgium foundry, silicon foundry in design house called, uh, called IMAC. We, we've shipped so far, well, uh, Jackson Lab has shipped 17,000 of our mice, so that's a very large number. We're doing annual conferences. We're releasing uh, modeling markup languages. As I mentioned, we're involved, um, it's spearheaded by, by somebody here in the, in, at the Allen Institute, Han Chuan Peng. We're involved in a very large um, effort to, do, to standardize these automatic uh, computer reconstruction method for single neurons. 
We, we're teaching uh, since several years together with Adrian Fairhall at the UW. We're teaching um, a workshop, a very intense two weeks long workshop in Friday Harbor here up on the islands. We are in, uh, as I mentioned, we're building this common coordinate framework and we are involved in the in the brain initiative. So these are some of the things that we are that we are right now doing. The one feature that makes us most different, I always get asked how are we different from uh, Caltech or Genelia or HHM or, or UW here. This is the one, if there's one feature I would point to that we're different, <coughs> is that we, you know, we're big, as we say, we're big science, team science, um, open science. But we sort of, we, we are driven by these, uh, you know, we have these milestones. So for example, we have a milestone to try to reconstruct. Um, this is with uh, Claire Reed and Nuno da Costa uh, over the next several years to reconstruct at the electromicroscopy level, a cubic millimeter of cortical tissue. We have a milestone with, um, in synapse biology with, um, with um, Stephen Smith and, and Linnea and, and other people in that team to try to do array tomographic reconstruction of the entire slide. So these are some of our big milestones that we try to achieve as time moves relentlessly on from when we kicked off this, the 10-year plan back in 2012 and then when the t sort of our current version of the 10-year plan ends in 2022. So these are some of our very ambitious goals for cell types, for, um, for uh, the, um, the connections, for the brain observatories, sort of building a series of ever more complex um, behaviors that we can image in large fraction of the, of, the, um, of the cortex of the mouse and then doing ever more sophisticated simulations. So lastly, I wanted to end, uh, in, I'm supposed to talk about leadership, I can't do that because I don't know how to talk about that. But I was going to end with something. I, I started my talk with uh, showing what a little brain, like a mouse brain, is capable of. And now I wanted to end by showing you what a big brain is capable of. All right. Slowly, though his heart was pounding like a runner's, Roman Opalka approached the canvas. He had painted it completely black. The date, so, though he set no store by dates, was 1965. Clenched in his left hand was a pot of white acrylic paint. Held tightly in his right was a number zero brush, the smaller standard size. He dipped the fine point into the paint and then, very gently, as if in slow motion, raised his arm. His hand was trembling. Carefully painted the figure one at the top left-hand corner of the canvas. At the same time, he whispered in his native Polish Jeden, one, the moment was so charged with emotion that he thought he might collapse. Instead, he had begun. He would thought about this for years, wondering how he might visualize time. He did not mean the time of clocks or calendars or hourglasses. Those were merely instruments of convenience for fixing points at which to have coffee or feed the cat. He meant the irreversible continuum of time that flowed through him, the pulse of his life, approaching his death within the vastness of infinity. By painting numbers in careful succession from one to infinity, or as near to it as he was destined to get, he would make a work of art that tracked as well as anything the movement of time in a life and life in time. The idea came easily enough. While he was waiting, while he was waiting one winter day in a cold cafe in Warsaw for his wife and his friends to come, glancing impatiently and watch at clock and watch, drumming the moments away on the table but it demanded nothing less than the sacrifice of his life. From the moment of painting the figure one until the day he died when he'd reached well past 5,500,000, his daily task was painting numbers and whispering their names eventually into a tape recorder. Hence his extreme emotion when he began, his own big bang signaling his own creation of space time. Each canvas was called a detail and all had the same title, Opalka, 1965, one to infinity. Typically, he would paint around 400 figures a day, standing almost motionless at the easel. He tried not to travel much, did not take holidays, and if the journey was unavoidable, made what he called carte de voyage, continuing his numbers in black ink on ordinary white paper. The work became so absorbing, so meditative, that he would try to paint at the deepest hour of night, when only the bark of a dog or distant cockcrow would disturb the southern French hillside where he lived. Hard troubled bothered him and he once found a little paint pot almost too heavy to lift, but he never considered stopping. The number 7,770,777 floated in his mind as a sort of completion of his program. But in fact, the completion would be his death, as he often said. 
His biggest innovation was to change the background color. In 1968, he made it gray. In 1972, when barely able to breathe, he passed one million. He decided to add 1% more white uh, to that gray every year. By 2008, the white of ground and figure was virtually the same, except that he thought of the ground as well-earned white. That's him. From 1968, at the end of every working day on, he took a black and white photograph of his impassive face against the canvas. This too was part of the project. It was not egoism or narcissism, he insisted. After all, his art told people nothing about his daily life. None of it. The birth in France, the childhood in Warsaw interrupted by war, the art studies in Warsaw, the year in Berlin, seemed important besides the immensity of the self-imposed task. He spoke about that when asked rather diffidently, softly rubbing the rim of his glasses in one hand, talking of Heidegger and Pascal and the ancient Greeks and the way they thought about numbers, smiling often with what seemed to be repressed joy. And why not? Though people saw him as a prisoner, he felt more liberated with every stroke of the brush. Each of his self-portraits with steadily silvering hair and whitening skin showed him progressing as inevitably as his numbers into the infinity he longed for. So I believe the search for science that we here dedicated to has that sort of intensity to it. It's something you can dedicate your life to. It's the endless search for patterns found in nature and then testing those patterns against, uh, against nature in the, in the forms of experiments. And I think that's something we can, and I certainly I try to aspire to in my own life, and we can all aspire to this intensity, this, this, uh, this purity. I read this, this was the obituary. Uh, uh, that appeared about him in The Economist. And that's the last number he, died, he wrote just before he died. And with that, I thank you for it. This is our team. This is our boat. Usually, I talk about the boat metaphor, the boys in the boat metaphor. Um, but um, today, I thought I should, I should talk about something different. So with that, I thank you for your attention. And I will introduce. It's over. <laughs>